Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm Ivan Lapte from INRE Paris, and today I'm going to talk about dynamics in understanding. So before we start with the talk, let's think for a bit, what does it mean to understand dynamic scenes? Or maybe even more generally, what does it mean to understand? So if you look up Wikipedia, so we see that understanding is a process, of course, uh, which uh, deals with abstract or physical objects. And uh, the purpose of this process is to deal adequately with this object. So this is interesting because it uh, implies that uh, understanding means we are looking for a task and understanding does depend on the task. So understand also means interpret or could be a sort of a translation process. Um, so if we now go back to scene understanding, so we could think of, uh, of this as a process which is task dependent translation of uh, scene X, which is uh, image or video of a dynamic scene, uh, which is being translated into some modality Y in a way such that uh, Y enables us or some other process to uh, make a task. So this notion of task, I think is very important. And, uh, uh, it relates to what we are trying to do with our research. So let's see examples of dynamic scenes and also tasks which we would may want to uh, address in relation to this uh, dynamic scene. So, so here is an image of uh, children playing chess under the tree. And you can imagine a task where we have a, a text-based video query, uh, YouTube, any other platform which wants to uh, search such uh, scenes by just typing text, or maybe we want to uh, caption these scenes automatically. So this is a uh, one task which implies uh, that we should interpret images or videos or dynamic scenes in relation to text. But this, of course, is not the only task which we may think about. So, so he, what, what about this picture? So here's a dynamic scene and uh, we all understand what may and uh, will happen if the guy is going to pull the clothes, table clothes. Um, but uh, so how can our methods currently handle this? So this is a task of prediction, which can be very important for example, uh, autonomous driving or in some other scenarios. So here's another, uh, example of dynamic scene which is actually unseen but you can imagine uh, that uh, a dynamic scene which translates or brings the state uh, of the world on the left to the state of the world on the right and uh, the task here could be a manipulation so what kind of actions are required to bring the state on the left to the state on the right uh, and uh, so trying to just think where we are in computer vision and uh, scene understanding. So I think on the, what we see on the left, so we have addressed these tasks for, for a while now. And um, so we have data sets which are have labeled actions or videos annotated with text. Uh, and I'm going to show some of our work uh, related to how to merge how to marry the um, uh, visual input and text. So this is, of course, interesting, important problem. Uh, it is hard, it is not yet solved, but uh, so we are, uh, people are looking into this. So the uh, two other uh, tasks which I mentioned, uh, prediction and manipulation, again, so they are addressed, but uh, addressing them in the wild is really hard. And uh, I think the, we've been, quite relatively to the hardness of the task, there's been, been quite uh, little work done in this domain. And uh, that's, I think, where the uh, future should be in scene dynamics in understanding. Uh, so let's see, what are the challenging uh, related to all these tasks? So, so first of all, that dynamic scenes and scenes in general, as we know, they're compositional. And compositional means that uh, it's very hard, it's going to be very hard to exhaustively uh, enumerate or sample all kinds of scenes 
which may happen. And examples which are here on the screen, they already clearly say, well, they visualize that uh, um, yeah, so the compositionality and the fact that it's going to be, if you, we are going to exhaustively and manually uh, annotate everything in the, in, uh, in, this, in the world around us, this is just not going to happen. And uh, so we need some tools and methods which uh, can deal without manual annotation, which is currently the mainstream or the, uh, behind the methods which work in computer vision. Yet another important point which I want to bring up is that uh, uh, lots of dynamic scenes are about physical interactions with the world, between, uh, between objects, between people and objects and so on. And so if we are just going to look at the pixels and try to associate them, them with words, which is fine if we want to search the videos, uh, if we want to, for example, provide instructions to people how to deal in the current situation, or even further, if you want to learn robots, which will uh, say make a pizza for us, we'll do something else. Just associating pixels with letters, with words, is most likely is not going to be enough. And we need more embodied reasoning and embodied interpretation of dynamical scenes. Right, so, uh, so this is my introduction, and now I want to switch to few works which we have done in uh, this domain. So I'm going to talk first about uh, uh, how to associate videos with text. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, ICC-19 and CPR 20 work done in our group. Uh, and then I'll work, talk more about uh, embodiment. And uh, in the first case, I'll talk about hands and objects and how to model them and uh, in the second work i'm going to talk about robotics manipulation so what what is although these three topics seem quite different so what is uh, uh, similar to all of them is that we are trying to address all of them without assuming we have uh, manual supervision any manual supervision almost and uh, and that's reasonable because uh, actually to address them like like already now or later, in, even in a larger scale, uh, it's not going to be possible to do it fully, uh, with a manual supervision. So we want to avoid it as much as possible. Okay, so let's start uh, first from uh, this work, which we published at ICCD uh, last year. And so we are looking at, uh, uh, so first, so what, what is our task? We would like to learn a joint embedding for video and text. So this is not a new task. Uh, so it could be useful for, uh, as we said, video uh, search by text, text search by video, video captioning and many other things. Okay, so you want to learn a joint embedding, embedding model. So, uh, and for this, so we don't want to use a uh, manual annotation. So we are going to search for resources which are available. And one interesting research, which is uh, widely available on the internet, are instructional videos. You may have uh, come across them either in computer vision literature or in your daily life. So there are lots of videos where, which are done by people, for people, they're not done for computer vision research. And these videos are, in these videos, people who made them, so they explain how they perform a particular task and they also show it. And uh, so these videos we have collected from YouTube. YouTube is now also very good to, uh, to do speech to text. So actually we can automatically with a high quality uh, trans uh, get the videos and uh, transcriptions of what people are saying. And here what you see just a few videos. We see uh, example videos. We see that uh, there are many videos for the same task. There are lots of different tasks. So we've started doing this work actually for quite a while ago, but more recently, so we wanted to go large scale. So we looked at uh, uh, much larger scale than hundreds of thousands of videos. So we looked at a uh, resource which is called VideoHow. VideoHow, uh, it's uh, not a video resource, it's just a text resource which describes how things are done in general in the world. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a hierarchy of tasks. 
Um, so you can find lots of things like how to be healthy, uh, how to sew an apron, how to break a chain and so on. And um, so many of these tasks are not physical. So we the, actually the only manual intervention we've done in the process of data collection was to go through um, a few thousands of tasks. I think there was uh, yeah, a few tens of thousands of tasks and uh, just say if this task is uh, uh, represents some physical interaction with objects or is it uh, how do you meet your girlfriend and so on. Right, so we just uh, filter them by hand. But everything else was, th that was relatively uh, small effort and everything else was done automatically. So what, what uh, did we get out of, uh, out of it? So first, as I said, so we, we took WikiHow, we fit them we, and to visual tasks and then uh, with the names of these tasks we went to YouTube and uh, collected lots of videos uh, which are transcribed so we can get uh, aligned trans transcriptions with the video and then for each piece of text, we can cut a piece of video and in this way we get about 130 millions of uh, short clips with corresponding text which is supposed to describe what happens in, in these videos. Okay, so these videos are not random videos, they are, uh, they are uh, seeded by WikiHow which is a resource of uh, uh, where description how uh, things are done. So, so these are not necessarily, but often instructional videos in this data set. Uh, but this could be also vlogs and some other videos. Um, right, and so we've done uh, zero manual annotation in terms of video uh, captioning by, by text. So we have, so here on the diagram, you see that there are different categories. There's uh, food, there's the largest one, there's uh, health, home gardening, pets, uh, hobbies, many others. Right, so here are just a few examples of how the data looks like. Uh, it is not clean and I will, uh, uh, I will tell you later what I mean by this, but we also see lots and lots of diverse realistic uh, examples which represent uh, different scenes, different tasks, different actions. So this is uh, uh, what we want. This is a, seems to be a good resource. So let's see what we can do with it. Uh, so first, what's the size of the data set? It's large. It's about a thousand times larger than the previous one. Once, uh, with the caveat that the uh, previous ones were manually annotated or at least verified manually that the captions for these uh, video data sets were correct. In our case, we don't know, or actually we do know. So we did a small study by sampling random videos from our data set and it turns out that about 50% of them actually are do not have correct text associated with them. So this is a problem and I will come back to it. Right, so now in terms of the model, uh, diagram is uh, looks complicated, actually there's uh, nothing special about it. So we are just having a, a pre-trained video representation, which was trained on a kinetics data set. We have pre-trained text representation. And then at the end, our joint embedding is just uh, few layers on top of pre-trained representations trained with uh, max margin ranking, ranking loss. So basically one of the uh, captions and corresponding videos in this new embedding space to be close to each other and uh, negative pairs means uh, captions from some other videos. Uh, they should be uh, far away from the current video. Okay, so this is a standard. So in terms of method, there's uh, not much here. So what's really interesting in this work is how much we can get out of this uh, very large data uh, and very noisy data. And here are a few uh, evaluations. So we see the first check on the UCOOK dataset, which is a similar domain to our, uh, our training data. Um, so, so we just take our embedding method, we train it on to so UCOOK 2 has a it's a great data set by the way, so it has a training data set, training set and test set, so we are just uh, trying our um, methods, well, the embedding uh, with max margin loss, uh, we train it on the training set of the UCOOK, we get some reasonable results which are comparable to the literature. And now what's interesting that if we take our new data set and we train on it and 
not not looking at UCOOK2 at all. And I think UCOOK2 was uh, specifically removed from our, our 200M. So we see that uh, this unsupervised data or self-supervised or whatever you want to call it, in any way that we didn't do uh, any manual annotation of it. So it's able to outperform state-of-the-art uh, on this data set, which was obtained with the super supervised. Uh, now, so the uh, yeah, so on, on the low on the low part of the screen, so you see uh, another task, so cross task. So here we see that uh, similarly, so we train on how how 200 M uh, performance out the uh, performance is higher than the state of the art. And if you fine tune on UCOOK2, if you fine tune, so it gives the further improvement, right? So here is a small study of uh, if we train on just part of the data set, we see a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. Uh, we see with more videos, the performance goes up. So we can imagine that it will go further as we collect more videos. And uh, this collecting videos is almost free. So we can just increase performance further by, uh, by getting more data. So uh, what are the challenges and limitations here? So first, already mentioned so the data is uh, just scraped so there are lots of actually noise in the uh, text coming from different because of different reasons so it's uh, it, because uh, well, transcriptions are not perfect uh, text and videos are often not aligned sometimes people talk about things before they do it sometimes they talk about it after sometimes they never talk about this what, what they do and so on so there's uh, lots of problems in this way. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's definitely a challenge and in the next part of my talk I'm going to, uh, we're going to see how to deal with this. Um, so another limitation is that uh, in this work we did not actually train visual representations. So the visual representation, the features, they were trained with, um, they were trained with the uh, uh, supervised kinetics data set and uh, which is slight, well it's video but it's a different domain so it would be interesting to see what happens if you try to learn the video video features uh, from our data and actually uh, also maybe if we can compete uh, for feature learning with uh, um, other methods which train video features on, su with, on supervised data sets such as kinetics. So this is exactly the topic of uh, next work I'm going to present. Um, so it has been done uh, in collaboration with DeepMind uh, in London. So uh, uh, let's see. So what uh, what do we have here? So so we are still we are starting from the same data set. How to handle them? It's large and uh, should be sufficient to train features. And so okay. So here is a you see video. You see a uh, description of it and okay, the, the, uh, the goal is still the same we want to bring we want to learn joint embedding where the videos and corresponding text close are close to each other in the, in the embedding space and otherwise they are far apart so here is the actual video with the sound And uh, what you could observe that actually it's not just one video and one caption, but uh, uh, that's what usually happens in this type of data where people are describing what they're doing. Um, so if they're not just talking about exactly what they're doing, they can be talking about many different things. And uh, as in the previous work, uh, so which I just described before, so what we normally would be taking, we would take this small video clip and would associate it with the closest um, description in time, which would be the fresh herbs, maybe some oregano. Okay, so this is not very informative, uh, and uh, training on this data has uh, will have problems because we would be associating. Uh, videos with something which is not very related and we will miss important information which is actually in the text. So, so here we show um, not just one but we, we show several 
textual descriptions. And indeed, like the first one and the last one here, they do uh, describe the content of the video much better. So the question is, how can we learn from this data? How can we, during training, pick the correct relations between the video and the text so that we learn correct associations and not the wrong ones? So here is a schematic view of the problem again. So we have a, we have a um, video, we have a few uh, descriptions which may or may not correspond to the video and uh, and uh, yes, so we want the corresponding descriptions to be close to the video which is a green dot on the sphere and non-corresponding descriptions to be far away. So, uh, and for this purpose, we are, we are introducing a new loss function, which is called uh, Milan C. So, multiple instance learning uh, and C loss. So, which is, uh, of course, inspired by the um, recent literature on NCEs. Uh, and so, what we are, how we adapted here, we uh, uh, instead of learning on single, uh, single positive examples, we have here in this uh, formula we have a sum so within the brackets you see the nominated denominator you see the sum which goes over positive examples where x and y is so x is a video y is a description pi these are tentative positive pairs so so if you have a video which i just showed you before so then uh, pi would be a all pairs of X a video and corresponding descriptions, which you just seen on the screen. So we assume all of them are potential positives. So this is a standard assumption in multiple instance learning. You assume a bag of positive, uh, well, I assume a positive bag which has at least one positive example, uh, but you not, don't require all of them to be positive. So, so it's represented here as a sum and uh, Okay, sum of what? So, so here is a just we do a dot product of uh, textual and uh, visual representations of x and y, right? And uh, and then uh, so in the, we have uh, positive examples and we also have negative examples. And the goal, of course, is to learn the representation, which is f and g, right? So g is a text network, f is a video network. And contrary to uh, what I've described before, here the video network is going to be learned from scratch. Okay, so bag of positives, how we sample it, we just take uh, a video, we take all neighboring, in terms of time, we take all neighboring um, descript textual descriptions, uh, and these are our positive examples. And for negatives, we just take any random videos, um, well, actually, there are different strategies how we sample uh, negatives that are important there in the paper. You can look it up. But in general, you can think of it as a random video, random description. Of course, you want to also sample hard negatives, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, some details you can find in the paper. Right, so the architecture is uh, not much different from uh, what we had before, except that now. Uh, we don't take pre-trained video features. We take a 3D scene and we learn from scratch. Um, so it's uh, some technical details. So it's 10 frames per second, 32 frames. So it means that we are around, uh, uh, we take a video clip, video cli our video clips are around three seconds. So it's uh, already some, it's not three minutes, but uh, three seconds can already capture quite uh, complex events. All right, and the text representation is uh, initially word to egg, and then, um, yes, yeah, so there are a few um, layers on top of it. Um, okay, so now let's look at the evaluation. So here are our tasks. So we, we try to, uh, so the hope of this work is to train really generic uh, video representation. So we try to evaluate it on uh, many different tasks and benchmarks. So we, we take three types of uh, problems, so action recognition, action localization, and text to video retrieval. And for each of them, we have two or three different data sets where we test on. So first, let's have a look at uh, comparison to the work which I just described before. So, so 
uh, our ICC United paper where we had pre-trained video representations pre-trained on kinetics. So this is the, uh, the left green bar. Uh, so if we test on UCOG2, so you remember we already, um, right, so if you take the pre-trained video representation, uh, if it uh, train on kinetics 400, and then we, we, on top of it, we train embedding using how 200M. Uh, so you remember that we already outperformed the state of the art, yet if you would fine tune it on uh, UCOG2, so you would get even better results. Now the red bar on the right is our new result, and what's striking is that uh, this result has been obtained without uh, training on Kinetics 400 or any other data set which had manual labels, and it was also not fine-tuned on uh, UCOG2 you see that results are much higher and uh, yeah, so by striking because this, these results obtain without any manual supervision. Right, so, uh, so a bit of uh, uh, arguing why MIL and C loss is, uh, is good. So uh, first let's look at just NC versus other losses. So, um, for example, max margin loss, which we have used in the previous paper. So here we see that uh, actually it does not perform very well. So we think that uh, it is because uh, we are training it with uh, uh, noisy data. So before the representations were fixed. Uh, so it's, uh, we, don't, we are not sure, if, we are not sure, but uh, we think that uh, uh, the noise in the data was less important when we were just training a few layers of embedding. When we now train the, uh, uh, the full video representation, the training might be, might be much more, uh, our method might be much more sensible, sensitive to errors uh, in, the, in the annotation. Okay, so NC versus margin loss uh, performs better. That has been confirmed some by other literature, so that's uh, just re reconfirmation interesting. But then, so if we look at mid and C, which is our new proposed loss, we see that the uh, results improve uh, quite a bit further, and this uh, justifies or validates the importance of the multiple instance learning mechanism. And uh, also not just any multiple instance learning. So for example, if you take max plus NC, which, uh, which is a standard, I guess one of the standard ways to implement multiple instance learning, so it performs uh, less good than our proposed mid and C loss. A few more results, so for action recognition, uh, we compare to self-supervised video representations on two data sets, HMDB, UCF, standard data sets for action recognition, we see that uh, performance uh, is good, uh, outperforms the uh, other methods. Uh, it's interesting in particular because uh, our data set, okay, we, we wish it to be, well, it is very large and we wish it to be generic, but actually we know that it has a strong bias towards instructional videos, whereas uh, HMDB and UCF, these are sports videos or actions from movies, very different domain, yet training video representation our data uh, gives very high performance, which is uh, interesting. And now, uh, so compared to uh, some other fully supervised representations, well, um, basically the, the representation kinetics 400, video representation trains on kinet kinetics, they are known to be strong video representations. We compare to these representations on several tasks. Um, uh, and we see on here on all four data sets, we see a significant improvement with our method, which is uh, also interesting. Okay, and so, so we have implemented this uh, on search. You can try it yourself. The link is on top of the screen, right? So if you just uh, type anything, cut pepper, so in real time, you will get uh, answers like this. And it's, uh, so it, the uh, demo online is, um, acquiring the UCOOK2 data set. And again, so we, we did not train of, on UCOOK2 and it's UCOOK2 uh, has not been part of uh, 100M data set. So our code and, and models are online. You're welcome to use them and uh, benefit from new strong representations. 
So I'm going to talk now about a uh, second piece of work, um, which is uh, now relates to handling of reconstructing 3D reconstructions of objects and hands. And this is a joint work with, uh, between INREA and uh, Mark Polyface Group in, uh, in Zurich, Microsoft Zurich. So what's the task here? The task is to give an, uh, just one RGB image to reconstruct of objects and hands. Why is it interesting? So first, yes, so we, there is lots of data. Of course, uh, one could think that if you have RGBD data, the task would be easier. On the other hand, again, if you think of all the instructional videos or other videos on the internet, uh, it's uh, RGB. And if you want to learn from this video, for example, to how to manipulate, uh, how to cook pizza or manipulate objects, uh, we need to be able to do it just from RGB data. So that's the motivation. Uh, we had a, now the problem is that, uh, uh, so there are methods, including our method from uh, last CPR uh, to reconstruct hands and object. The problem is that this, uh, the supervised approach is uh, complicated because the data is very um, scarce. So, um, so, so the, there are three data sets which uh, are not with, without markers and which uh, have objects and hands, like uh, objects manipulated by hands. So they are all done by manually verifying the ground truth. They are not very precise. Some are more precise, some are less precise. And because of this manual verification, so they are limited in the number of objects, number of, number of scenes and so on. And now, of course, the, the size of data is very small. So in this work, which is going to appear or has appeared at CPR uh, this year, so we ask the question, okay, if we cannot, um, but doing it without annotation, well, we tried, so we didn't succeed. So at least uh, uh, can, we do, can we do reconstruction with the, by limiting the amount of annotation? One way to limit annotation, because it's videos, can say we're just going to annotate maybe one frame every hundredth frame and that's going to cut the annotation cost already by 100 which would be a great uh, great thing okay so so our setup is the following we take a video we assume that there is only a uh, few frames annotated in it and uh, the rest you want to um, basically you want to uh, learn not only from annotated frames but from other frames as well uh, so what's our model? So it's a neural network model which uh, reconstructs the hand uh, into a parametric uh, hand model called MANO. It also reconstructs the object uh, into a mesh. So both are mesh models, so both MANO and object, they are mesh models. And uh, yes, yeah, so you can find details of, of this in our previous CPR paper. Uh, things in terms of uh, modeling the hands and object things did not change. So what really changed is the way we try to deal with the missing supervision. Okay, so assume that we have a reference frame and um, which has, has been annotated and then we have some prediction on a frame reference plus time reference plus k. Uh, so what we are going to do, we are going to uh, align the, uh, we are going to estimate the uh, uh, paramet parameters of, uh, of a hand and, and object. And then we are going to, because in both cases, so in ground truth and the reconstructed meshes, uh, objects and hands, these are meshes, so we can actually compute the 3D flow between uh, them. Okay, and that's what you see here on the screen. And the 3D flow, uh, is going to tell us how the uh, mesh moves between the ground truth and the um, uh, and our reconstruction, and we want this reconstruct this. Uh, uh, so now taking these uh, flows, uh, we are we are now able to warp the uh, image pixels from ground truth image into the uh, frame where where we don't have ground truth. And then uh, we are going to assume that uh, well, the elimination didn't change too much, right? There are not too many occlusions. Uh, okay, this won't be true if you take too long intervals, but if we are in a uh, sort of span of several tens of frames or 
one to seconds, so hopefully you can assume this. And uh, so what makes this model interesting that it's fully differentiable. So it means that uh, we, are going, we are reconstructing the hands and we are uh, using the known, assuming we know the camera parameters, we are uh, warping uh, the reconstructed uh, object into the um, ground truth frame and in this way we are able to compare the pixels and uh, derive a photometric consistency loss okay. so um, which is shown here on the right okay and so here are some uh, results so uh, here we are we are training only with a 65 percent of fully suppressed frames right so it's uh, uh, and so we see original frame run truth. And if we just take uh, this 65% uh, of 0.65% uh, of uh, annotated data, we see that our re the model which uh, produced with this amount of training data is really not uh, great. Uh, so you see lots of errors. And, uh, and here is uh, uh, the result of when we apply the photometric consistency loss and we see that uh, results improve a lot. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to the last topic of today, to robotics manipulation. Um, so this is work has been done by uh, yeah, at Ingvea. And so the um, motivating uh, story of this work is to, uh, we wish to um, we wish to uh, find out what actions are necessary to change the world from state one to state two. Okay, so this is a typical problem. You buy IKEA furniture, you want to know how to construct it. Or maybe you buy a house, you want to maybe imagine something which looks uh, different. You, you wonder how should you build this. So, so this is an interesting problem. Um, of course, it's uh, what the examples shown here, they are way too hard. So we are start starting with some, something simple, more simpler. Uh, but uh, we want nevertheless to have some uh, more generic assumptions. So we want our method potentially to handle complex and diverse uh, scenes. And we, so we don't want to make an explicit uh, assumption about the state of the world. Uh, and you want, in this case, you only want to rely on visual sensors uh, to, to uh, find, out, find out what actions are necessary to bring the state uh, from the left, the world from the, uh, on the left to the right. Okay, so in this uh, work, we are trying, uh, uh, trying to learn how to build a object categories. And categories for us here are defined by uh, geometry. So for example, an arc. Uh, so we, we take, a, uh, we assume we have some process which tells us okay, if uh, the robot is building something, is it, is it similar to arc or not? Okay, so details are in the paper, not, not so important. Uh, and we also assume that we have, we initiate our process with an arc, with the one example of an arc. Okay, so, and then everything else is open. We want just given an image on the left, we want our robot to learn uh, uh, what, how to, to build an arc on the right. So how do we do it? So again, so why this uh, uh, fits the story of this talk is because we don't want to, we deliberately don't want to annotate or provide uh, knowledge to how should the arc be built because this can, not, this can be not an arc, this can be anything in the future, hopefully. Right, so uh, what's the approach? The approach is divided into two parts. So first part is we are, we are first going to discover the plans of building arcs in state space. And then we are going to learn visual policies uh, in observation space. Okay, so here are a few examples what our robot can make. So, and what's interesting about the methods, so because we are not even attempting to do any uh, recognition or reconstruction of primitives, so we're just giving an RGBD image. 
And uh, even if the robot is trained on uh, this type of synthetic data, which is a year, so it's actually able to handle quite well uh, new primitives, which are given at test time on the table. So here are a few examples. And uh, so here is the, uh, our motivating example. Is okay, so let me summarize. So I've talked about a uh, few things which are related to uh, understanding dynamic scenes. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, understanding dynamic scenes means many things, not just uh, associating videos with the text or videos with the labels, but actually uh, understanding is related to different tasks which uh, could be uh, related to dynamic scenes. And uh, this, of course, could be a uh, video search, but uh, it could also be uh, providing instructions to people or providing instructions to robots. And for this, we need uh, understanding implies all, not just uh, labeling or associating text, but also uh, having embodied uh, reasoning. And uh, so that's what uh, we are trying to do in our recent work and hopefully in the future. So these pieces, they will be connected and they will reinforce each other, which is currently not the case, but that's, uh, I think, where the future is for video understanding, uh, which just uh, combines together video understanding, robotics, uh, language understanding, and uh, yeah, many exciting domains. So thank you for listening, and uh, I will be happy to take questions.